Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, confession time after being out in a field in Glastonbury for five days and sitting out in the sun today. I'm recording today's podcast with a slightly sunburnt face, so who knows what today's guest thought when he saw me on camera. But his name is Andrew Yates, and he appeared on my radar when I originally read about their backstory, which involved Andrew and Dan meeting at Pinterest, where they helped build ad systems at Facebook and Google, and realised that performance ad tech could better run entire marketplaces not just ads, they began to think bigger. So they started Promoted AI to match every buyer with every seller across every app. And they've been on an amazing journey, which has took them through Y Combinator, not to mention the uh, being the core function of some of the biggest companies in tech, such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., all washed down with a great story. But enough from me. Buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to San Francisco, where Andrew Yates is waiting to share his story. So, a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Hi, Hi Neil. Uh, I'm Andrew, uh, Andrew Yates. I'm CEO and founder of Promoted AI. Promoted AI, we uh, optimize marketplaces. We like, for example, if you've ever used Airbnb or, or Amazon, we sort search and feed and, and promote the best listings at the top to increase revenue. And all those services you just mentioned, people will know all about. But what I try and do on this podcast is let people have a peek behind the curtain, a look under the hood. So today I invited you on the podcast to learn more about engineering and optimizing marketplaces. So just to set the scene, can you tell me more about how data engineering is the core function of some of the biggest companies in tech, such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, well, so many others you can you can name too. But can you expand on that for me? Yeah, absolutely. For search, which is, or, or, or presentation, when you, when you are selling discovery, really all you have is that data. You have measurement. You are selling, or did was this seen? Did someone engage with it? Did did seeing this thing cause somebody to take some action later? That's the business that runs Silicon Valley. That's the core business of Google. That's the core business of Facebook. That's the core business of of Amazon and, and retailers. You just have a screen, some pixels. Someone did something and log it, and somehow that transforms into a trillion dollar market. To get more concrete into this. Being able to maximize the efficiency of these marketplaces or e-commerce apps or social media, the first step of anything is measuring it correctly. And on one side, that's a lot of data. That's like everything you looked at. Did you did you engage with it? Um, there's a lot of streaming data making that available, a lot of infrastructure involved with that. Then there's the uncertainty part of it, and this is where it starts to get interesting, where um, if if you've ever run an ad campaign, um, maybe, maybe if you had a small business or, you know, for work, there's a question of did this ad cause somebody to take an action? And now you've added an uncertainty into your, your data pipeline. So now you have to deal with these things like, well, what if you don't have a way to join records, but you have to guess? And that really magnifies the complexity of what these data pipelines have to do. And they still have to be real time. And like if you are in the advertising business, they're auditable. Uh, if you get the Wall Street Journal here in the United States or I guess anywhere, uh, they love publishing when some major ad network or Facebook or somebody misinterprets or somehow miscomputes a, a metric. Um, that's data infrastructure and data engineering, and it's the order of billions of dollars, and it's a big deal. So that's the philosophy of data engineering and processing. And this is all separate, by the way, from like the data privacy issues things. I, I kind of want to separate all of that privacy consideration, which is also very important, yeah. but it's I think it sucks up all the oxygen in the room regarding the technical discussion of what the technology is doing, what the challenges are. 
versus like, I, I would like to talk a little bit more about the challenges of just collecting all this data, aggregating, joining it and dealing with uncertainty. And then once you have this measurement, then you can either sell it uh, in terms of like discovery, like you do ads, that are, like I'm getting impressions, clicks and conversions, and you can also optimize against it. So that's getting into the other piece of uncertainty, which is uncertainty about the future. Did things that happened in the past, if you can accurately measure them, help you predict what's likely to happen in the future? And that's how all of these recommendation engines and for that matter, search engines, how they're automatically learning about well, this was a good result for this query, or this was a good entry to put into a feed for this user. Um, that measurement is driving the optimization side. So these are the two things that we super we focus on. And then the promotion side or the ad tech side, that's like a layer on top of the maximization, which is what if you want to sell ability to be discovered? Uh, in our philosophy, first, you need to have a really good concept of here's what a good match is and here's the value of it. And if you want to change that, here's how much it costs. And as you said a few moments ago, the subject of ads uh, does have a bad reputation around privacy, etc. It does suck all the energy out of the room. It's already well documented and talked about just about everywhere. So uh, it is nice to have a different approach today. And before you came on, I, I was reading your belief that another way of thinking of ads, a, a way to raise prices on sellers in a much more fairer basis. Can, can you tell me more about that belief? Yeah, yeah. Um... Think of it as like Amazon, for example. I, I think this is a little bit different than, let's say, a like brand advertisement where, let's say, you have a blog or your social media and you are um, just allowing uh, a, people to put banner ads. This is more of like the abstraction of, let's say, Amazon or, or DoorDash where they're doing paid promotions and it's things that are already for sale in their marketplace. So th the way to think of this is that, well... From the seller's perspective, it's it's math. It's money in and it's money out. Here's how much I made in revenue. Here's how much I had to pay in costs. Um, one way for the marketplace to... The marketplace already, their core business is a fraction of sales on, let's say, Amazon or, or Airbnb or any of these e-commerce or marketplaces. They take a fraction of the sale, plus like some sort of merchandising fee, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, one way for the marketplace to become more profitable is just to say, okay, before we were charging 20% of the sale, now it's 25%. Or now it's like an extra dollar fee. You just, hey, everyone, you pay more. Yeah. Well, if, if it was so easy, they would just keep raising the prices forever. Like, why not just make infinite money, right? Why not 100%, right? Well, okay. <laughs> because there is, it's, it's inefficient. Some sellers are willing to pay higher, um, more fees to the marketplace. Other sellers will pay less. They're not going to tell you outright. They're not going to say, "Hey, I hey, raise my hand. Hey, I I would actually love to pay more." No, they <laughs> they want to pay the minimum amount to get maximize their profits. So you can think of ads as a way to optimize for that take rate for sellers. Um, so some sellers are effectively paying, let's say, thirty percent, and other sellers are effectively paying, let's say, twenty percent. And it's not like you get to choose a, a select box like, okay, I choose 20%, I choose 30%. It's more like, okay, you make trade-offs. So if you pay a higher fraction to the marketplace, you need to get something back in return. And what you get back in return is usually more volume. So you're trading off um, mar or, or maybe variability is another, like you're trading off um, margins for, for volume and prominence. And if you think of it that way, then when you see, let's say, Amazon, you see these numbers of, oh, Am I, I forget the latest number, but it's, it's billions of dollars is, is being generated by ads on, on Amazon. And then that's just sort of the rest of the business is just sort of a lost leader. Um, I know that's funny to think about, oh, yeah, could they just like just do ads? Of course not. It, the, the, what's really happening here is they've created their ad system as like it's, it's the profit optimization. So lo and behold, if you just attribute profits to the last layer of the profit optimi optimizer, sure, it looks like it's all being driven by that. But if you think about take a step back and you use some common sense, it's like, no, 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 this is the last optimizer for profits and you're just attributing it to this, this system. So I think once you start zooming out a little bit to, let's say, Amazon case or um, these other big marketplaces where you look at their ads business and it's driving all of these quote unquote huge profits, it's more like, no, that's the whole business. And that's just 
the last layer where they're optimizing, here's how much profitability you can pull out in the most efficient way. And if we were to take a look under the hood, can you tell me a little bit more about how search and discovery teams are built at these large companies that we're talking about? Typically, there exists a search team, yeah. there's a ads team, and there's a merchandising team. And there's like a data team and maybe a data science team on the side. It's organically built. You know, people have their areas. The, the challenge here, though, is you only have, you only have one marketplace. And one e-commerce app. And these teams are competing for the same user's attention. Uh, from like how these teams are built, uh, frequently you have a search team that's really good at retrieval and they're really good at like query relevance. You'll have an ads team that's really good at, or they better be good at measurement, like exact measurement, like data streaming, getting those metrics in place. And then the merchandising team may have a lot of really fantastic different formats and different ways of like controlling the, the product. But what you really want is all of those things all combined into like one, one function. And some companies are really good at this, like let's say Amazon or Facebook has been. Other companies are still developing their expertise. And as someone that's right in the heart of this space, you're probably seeing it continuously evolve and, and it's going to continue to do that too. So I'm curious, how, how do you see the future of commercial search and discovery tech and, and where, where it's heading? Is there anything that stands out to you? It's certainly becoming much more important mm. because people are on their phones all of the time. Yeah. As, as retail <laughs> becomes more and more abstract and electronic and it's just your phone, deciding what goes on your phone screen is incredibly important. That's your portal to people's attention and their wallets ultimately. Unlike maybe the past where it was the retail, you walk into the store and owning that specific location and you come into the store and the experience of it. So it's like taking some of the ideas from old world retail and moving them to phone. And some of them translate well, and some of them are totally new. Uh, it's, I, I don't think the core philosophy of measuring people's attention and doing this economic trade-off between the seller's interest, the buyer's interest, and the, the platform or the marketplace interest. I think philosophically, that'll continue to remain the same. Um, the trend that I see is, especially recently, people are much more interested in that unified optimization. Like it's, you, you can't get away with free money for growth forever when is it going to be profitable? And that's when the, the trend that we're seeing is people are a lot more serious now about, oh, is this going to be a sustainable business? And not only that, but users or buyers, households are much more serious about like, hey, is this something that I really, really need to buy? Or maybe not. And then for sellers, it's like, oh, wow, like, do we have to raise our prices? Like how, what are we going to do? Like ads are too expensive and our costs are going up, we're really super serious. So I think the gravity of being able to solve these sort of profitability economic equations uh, has become much more important recently. Whereas I, I'd say a year ago, uh, it was like peak bubble time and money is free. So, okay, well, you, know, you can optimize. It's pretty easy when you have like this three-sided optimizer. It's like, let's just focus on one of these sides. All right, growth, right? Maximum GMV. Well, now, now uh, the, the let's say the chickens have come to come to roost, and uh, people are much more serious about profits at scale as opposed to just scale at scale. And we will have people listening from a variety of backgrounds. So, for those people outside of the space, could you just offer a very brief overview on how ad engineering works behind the scenes? And also for the ad engineers listening, are there any tips or advice that you would offer on how to design great ad marketplaces? For, we have a unique perspective that yeah. there is a whole multi-decade area of, of ad tech that we really don't have any experience with or use, like real-time bidding or like banner ads, web ads. I know very little about this, frankly, and I'm not that interested. Our perspectives here are, what if you work at Facebook or Google like or Pinterest, uh, Dan and I, my co-founder, we were EMs together at Pinterest and Pinterest ads. It's it's a different philosophy in the sense that 
you're, you're thinking in terms of the entire experience, like the entire app versus like these sort of real-time bidding and sort of transacting on consumer data. It's much more focused on, I, I would say it's much closer to search and discovery plus. So it's like you're solving recommenders or like with, well, without the ads, like forget ads part. It's just search and discovery for um, a marketplace. But you also have to be accountable for measuring it correctly, communicating those metrics to sellers and it's other people's money. And you have to communicate your decisions in dollars. So from like a technology perspective here, the big difference between let's say ads engineering from search and discovery and just like ordinary search and discovery is it's other people's money. And all of your decisions are denominated in dollars and there's trade-offs. So it's not just maximizing. It's like you have this, you, you try to maximize one part, but that minimizes another part. You have to do this balancing. So from an engineering perspective, uh, the philosophy of taking this, these learnings from, let's say, Facebook ads engineering or Google ads engineering or Pinterest ads engineering is much more emphasis on correct measurement versus like directionally correct, like A, B experimentation. It's like, no, every data point needs to be correct because people measure it. Like that's that's what you sell. And the other is it's not just the presentation of what you show. It's not just you showed the right thing. It's how much did it cost the price? How much did this, did showing this was a profitable decision, not just a good decision. And that these two layers of complexity, um, it's, it's our superpower at Promoted for being able to do such a fantastic job of search and discovery because the, the data bar is higher. So we have better quality data so we can do better quality optimization. And that's, that's the long and the short of it. But it's also like how you can power performance ads at, um, at, at top, com top companies. So I, I guess the big question is, how is Promoted AI planning to better match every buyer with every seller across all marketplaces, on the web, all mobile, et cetera? C can you expand on that and how you're doing that? Yeah. Rather than say, hey, we have a network, you know, join our network. That's not what we're doing. And in fact, we don't, we don't have a ad network today. What we have are fantastic top marketplaces that we help optimize and measure as infrastructure. The, our philosophy is you need to have your own house in order before you can start opening up your house to others. And that starts with measuring your everything happening already in your current, on, on your app, like get the right data, then maximize your own conversions and sales. Three is run your own promotions internally. And only then when you can do it for yourself, then you can open up and start taking your inventory and put it elsewhere or bring in inventory from elsewhere. Because that way, you know that this is incrementally an improvement over on top of the best that you could already be doing. And so our strategy here has been work with the absolute best marketplaces, best engineering teams, get them to the same standardized level of, of sophistication and quality and now you have a standardized interface about measurement and optimization that you can start networking together on the back end to do these cross promotions. That, that's our ultimate vision here. And before you came on the podcast today, I was doing a little bit of research and I noticed that Promoted AI got into a Y Combinator. So I've got to ask, what was that experience like? Were, were any big takeaways from that? Yeah. Um, first, I highly recommend Y Combinator. Yeah. Generally... It's it's like, should I go to Harvard? And it's like, look, if you have to ask, probably go go for it, right? If you know better, like, no, I actually want to go to you know CMU or something, yeah, or, or Tsinghua or something. Like, yeah, man, go go where you want, but it's a good default. If you don't know any better, it, it's a great default place to go. A great community, a lot of support, um, and I think the biggest advantage is that they accelerate you past the the crappiest most fragile part of your business and also help you avoid some of the, the lamest mistakes that uh, that magnify, right? It's like kind of your genesis, uh, these sort of early mistakes just sort of stick around forever. Um, they help you smooth that out. It's expensive. I mean, I do want to call out that, yeah, it's not it's not free. Although they, they upped their, their offer recently, which is awesome. Um, so just as a quick, hey, should I join Wine Combinator? That's a pretty popular question, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, to you know, how do I get into Y Combinator is usually the follow-up question on that. Or like, what's your advice? 
um, say fewer words and have a convincing story about why you specifically would be successful. If you don't have that answer, you should make one like find if you don't know the answer, then they're not going to know. And that's not good. Right. Like yeah, have yeah. an answer. And then from my experience personally, we did it in peak COVID. So we were winter 2021. <laughs> no one really enjoyed COVID. I don't think uh, we didn't enjoy it, but the experience was different. Um, it was extremely efficient. It wasn't fun. Right. Uh, it was like, what if, what if what you did is you just sat in a chair and faced your computer for a year and you didn't move and you just worked like no parties, no networking. If you need to meet someone for raising money, you send an email and they do a zoom call and they're like, how much do you want? You say, I want X. And they're like, okay. Or no, <laughs> you know, like no coffee chat. Yeah. And, it, and there are advantages to this and there are disadvantages to this. <laughs> so uh, my experience with Y Combinator won't be replicated and definitely hope it won't ever be because that was the peak lockdown period and it was a weird time. Um, and there were special advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, that said, uh, Y Combinator is now opened up and it's in person now and you can meet people and they're going back to some of their classes and saying, oh, well, we can meet you in person now, which is great. Um, by the way, uh, we'll, we'll, by the time this goes out, we'll be already announced. I was, I was just talking to, to TechCrunch just right before this, and we're going to announce our continuation of our funding from Y Combinator. Y Combinator invested in another uh, several million dollars into to our company. So that's another thing about Y Combinator is it's not just a program and then, you know, that's the end, you know, Y Combinator logo forever. No, it's... It's forever. It's a part of your life. It's, you're part of the community, and that means you're part of the community. And it doesn't end at just their seed stage or demo day. It's a continuation forever. Wow, that's a fantastic story. And oh, you've made it through. You're enjoying the benefits now, and we're in a post-pandemic world. So I've got to ask, what's next for Promoted AI? Where do you go from here? Yeah, the biggest is just keep doubling down on our current top customers and and getting more of them. Uh, you know, there was a interview the other day. It's like, when, when did you know the product worked? And I'm like, yesterday, you know, <laughs> we're, we're at double digit improvements for, for OutSchool, for, for HipCamp. Um, we've, we've got some fantastic other partners that some public, some, some not yet public, but we're never satisfied. We want more. Uh, our biggest challenge and, and a little something that makes us unique in comparison to there's lots of like ML in a box, lots of like, Hey, marketplace, easy mode, start, get started. Like lots of ads mode, get started a search. There's a goalie out there for search. Right. Um, we really, really, really focus on top marketplaces that are already scaled or have engineering teams. So that means the bar is really high. <laughs> <laughs> and and if and if you just kind of like oh yeah we got double digits you know we're great you no know, be happy forever no 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 there's there's that was good yesterday but today no we need another percent improvement and you know the day after that we need another percent improvement and the nature of this business with the data infrastructure and machine learning is it's multiplicative right it's oh. I'm adding this extra component, but it interacts with every other component as well. So voila, you've just created much more complexity for smaller and smaller gains. So that's the race that we have is um, taking what we currently have, continuing to invest in making it even better, but then that also increases your cost a lot. So from our side, it's like this forever goal of adding more data, which increases our costs, which then we have to increase our infrastructure, but then that increases latency. So we have to reduce the latency. And then, you know, it's like, that's the main thing for us is just keep that loop uh, going of make the absolute best optimizer. And then once you have a really fantastic optimizer uh, and the data infrastructure to support it, then there's lots of great things you can do like ads or discount promotions, like, how, how do you optimize? Um, how, how do I know if I was in slot 10 and if I was in slot one, uh, that's going to increase my sales and by how much and how much is that worth? Well, man, you've just 
think about all the pieces into that, right? You need to know what the value is if you didn't do it. You need to measure the value for all of it. And then you need to predict all of the conversion optimization. And then you need to measure the user experience and like put at the top, maybe degrades the user experience. So what's that worth? And does the price you're willing to pay exceed that, right? Like just keep hitting that loop. So keep investing in our core product for our top customers and then bringing on even more similar top customers. And then eventually it's that cross promotions vision of, wow, we're actually powering all of the greatest marketplaces in the world. Um, that's a pretty interesting book of inventory if you're an ads business, isn't it? It really is. And it's a story I'll be following very closely. And it'd be great to stay in touch with you and get you back on maybe next year and find out how that journey's going. But before I do let you go, I'm going to have a bit of fun with you now. I always like to ask my guests to leave a personal note of inspiration with everyone listening. Now, that can either be a song choice that we can add to our Spotify playlist, a song that inspires you or helps you get your head in the zone, or a book that we can add to our Amazon wish list. What are you going to leave everyone listening with today? You know what? I think I think I looked at your Spotify list and I'm going to I'm going to blow I'm going to be that guy and kind of blow up your your Spotify list with something that doesn't quite fit. Oh, bro. Um, I, well, well, I had a guy a few weeks ago um, put on pirate metal, so you're going to have to go there, man. <laughs> pirate metal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> how about um, I really like Cowgirl by Underworld. Oh, that's a good tune. Yeah, like that early 90s yeah. UK uh, electronica scene. There's just like something about that era. It's like, wow, computers. They're amazing. And you have like these memes of, you know, the kid with the spiky hair on the computer and you know, a big old C- C- R- C monitor and you're like the 90s hacker, you know, I'm in. And, um, but it was just like, wow, the internet. Yeah. You know, you can be in your house anywhere in the world and be nobody just like a, for, for me, frankly, I'm just a kid from Midwest, you know, and but you could be somebody if you're really good at this. And that song is just that reminder of, wow, this, this magical world. And it turns out that actually making things work is a lot of work and like, you know, it's a job, but <laughs> you know, that song kind of harkens back to a more innocent time of you know, when you sit down at the computer to, to write code, it's like, that's a cool thing. You find your sunglasses and your trench coat or something like, yeah, and they're going to go out to the rave next door, you know, the matrix sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I guess that sort of hypothetically, the funny thing is, you know, I live in San Francisco and if you want to do that, you can, right? Yeah. Uh, but you don't because it's ridiculous. You need, first of all, I need to see my computer screen and sunglasses aren't going to work and like going to the rave, man, I'm, I'm getting old, right? It's like, you did it a couple of times and then it's like, oh yeah, that's what it is. And then I stay at home with my wife and uh, Netflix and chill is kind of what I'm really passionate about these days. But uh, yeah. anyways, Cowgirl by Underworld, uh, reliving the the that that sixteen to you know twenty five year old you about the, the dreams of being in technology. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I'll be listening to that as um, as soon as we finish this call today. It's, you're never too old to uh, to rave, definitely. But uh, before I let you go, for anyone listening, just wanting to find out more information about Promoted AI, dig a little bit deeper on any of the topics we talked about, reach your team or. Uh, contact you even. What's the best starting point for everything? Oh, our website, promoted.ai. Awesome. Well, I'll add those links to the show notes so people can find you nice and easy. Love chatting with you. Great story. And I love how you've simplified everything, put it in a language that everyone can understand, which is something I try and do on here. But I meant what I said a few moments ago. We'll stay in touch, and uh, it'd be great to see how your journey continues to evolve and maybe get you on later in the year or next year. But thanks for sharing that today. Well, thank you, Neil. It was a pleasure. I know we only scratched the surface of this topic, but I really enjoyed today's conversation. And if there is anybody else listening in the industry who've got different insights or any story that you'd like to share with me, or even if you've just got a few questions, remember, email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, just at Neil C. Hughes. Send me a DM. Don't just hit the follow button. Let me know you listen to the show, what you like, what you don't like, whatever it might be. And uh, we'll keep this conversation going. But other than that, it's time for me to get out of here. And I'll return again tomorrow with another great guest. So thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. 
Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.